Oh, <laughs> I, showed, okay. I showed like a volume series between one year to another year. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Okay, so now the next game. So turn the clock forward, 1982-83. Uh, the year before, I'd been playing in a tournament in Manchester. And uh, I may have even lost to Miles in that tournament. I lost to Miles somewhere in some tournament where, you know, as a kid in those days, I didn't have my systems worked out. And I also didn't have unified organized openings. Today, mm -hmm. most of my openings with black are based on G6. And then it's a question of which way we go from there, okay? Do we go sniper? Do we go Jinji Indian? Do we go accelerated dragon? My latest love, the Norwegian rat baby, okay? <laughs> which, which I got from Magnus Carlsen. Tell mm -hmm. you the truth, quick quick aside, I know I'm, I'm a little out of order here, but the uh, I'm watching Magnus Carlsen play Banner Blitz. And, and here's the thing. One of the things, like, for example, when I was at one of these Lone Pine tournaments and I traveled with a bunch of players, like, down to, uh, uh, you know, like, L.A. or whatever, you know, before getting on a flight or whatever. Yeah. And so Poligayevsky, famous grandmaster, he'd been the Russian, one of the Russians at Lone Pine that year. And he was given a lecture at the Santa Monica Chess Club. And one of my buddies that I was staying with, hey, you want to go? I'm like, yeah, duh. And I was very impressed with how professional he was, you know, like going over variations. In those days, we had the old demo board and so forth, mm -hmm. but consummate professional. And myself, uh, long after I was a grandmaster, I've always loved, you know, like one year at the National Open, I saw Walter Brown, you know, uh, lecture. And he was showing like an open Rui Lopez, which I've never really understood those positions so much for white. And he was explaining like some of the different weaknesses in the black pawn structure, which I'd never really, you know, had a grasp of. Yeah. And I saw Kamsky do a fantastic lecture on the uh, London, you know, some game against some guy I've never heard of, but it was very, uh, very, very deep analysis. And so I've always loved to go see other grandmasters uh, lecture. Like I learned so much about the Benko Gambit uh, back in the 90s when I made a video with Lev Albert. And I was like, darn, I wish I'd known all this back when I kept losing to the Benko Gambit. <laughs> <laughs> this would have been a big help. Mm -hmm. but, for example, in the Benko Gambit, White is a pawn up. Well, normally you're taught when you're ahead, not afraid to trade. You should trade. However, in the Benko Gambit, a lot of times this is a mistake because the end game actually a pawn down for black offers him better chances. Mm -hmm. Karpov and Albert both taught me, and there's a classic game that you got to see uh, Karpov against Gelfand from their Sangi Nagar match. And Gelfand played the Benko Gambit against him, and Karpov brought his queen out to g4 and attacked him on the king's side. And it turns out that in the Benko Gambit, because all of black's pieces naturally flow to the queen's side, white's chances actually lie on the king's side, which is a little counterintuitive because a lot of times the players with white, I mean, yeah, there are some games where white wins by pushing his a pawn, you know, ramming it up the board and so forth. I've won right. games like that. But in general, White does not want to trade queens. He wants to keep the queens on the board. In this game, Karpov Gelfand is a fantastic example of that. Karpov covered it in one of his videos. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, this is a bit counterintuitive. And if you just play by normal principles, and I'm a pawn ahead, I got to trade queens, and then they get all this pressure in the end game. Okay. And so, uh, so I've always been a big fan of going to lectures. You know, I've learned so much. Now that said. Roshevsky was a great name, but I saw him do a lecture or a lesson or something at the Marshall Chess Club, and I was extremely unduly unimpressed, I must say. Mm -hmm. It's like someone's asking him about the French, and he's like, oh, you just play 92. You know, it's a little better for white. You know, that's it. That, that was like the height of his departing knowledge. Uh, needless to say, I was not very impressed, okay? But... But a lot of the lectures that I've attended over the years by other grandmasters, like when I was at the Vegas and they had lectures, you know, five, six, seven, eight years ago, uh, if I had time and I could attend a lecture by someone like Albert or Brown or some of these guys, man, I'm, I'm there, you know, because it's just good. You learn to look at different things, things right. that you hadn't thought of. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, uh, oh. No, the lectures are online. <laughs> so I was talking about 1982. And I'm playing in a tournament in Manchester, and I found out, uh, somehow I met some of the Indonesian players, and, uh, you know, I'm in the skills room and, you know, going over some of their games with them and whatever, 
And I find out, oh, did you hear about this big tournament we're having, you know, like in February next year? I'm like, oh yeah, maybe it was like late 81. And I'm like, oh yeah, they're like, oh yeah, it's gonna be a big tournament that's gonna be possible to make a Grandmaster Norm like in one tournament. And wow. in those days, you had to play in three tournaments. Tournaments generally tended to be seven to nine rounds and you had to get three Grandmaster Norms and have like a 2,500 rating or something. And so uh, they're like, yeah. And so what happened was uh, uh, Madam Suerto, wife of the President Suerto, uh, wanted to bring chess to the masses in Indonesia, which is great. And it makes sense because it's economical. You know, I mean, they got wooden carvings all over the place. So mm -hmm. it's very easy for them to have wooden chess sets and so forth. Doesn't, not like golf or tennis, you know, <laughs> uh, where they need expensive rackets and golf clubs and such. Oh, yeah. So uh, they were going to have some of the best players, like one or two of the best players from each top chess country that they could. And then they were going to have a handful of five or six talented uh, local players. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so like from Indonesia, they got Ardianza, was like first Indonesian grandmaster at that time, I Indian grandmaster. Uh, Anand had not, you know, yet arrived on the scene for another 15 years. And uh, from England, they had uh, Grandmaster Raymond Keane and Murray Chandler. The Soviets, they were on the outs with the Soviets that year, so there was no Soviet representation. But from Hungary, they had like Zoltan Ribley, who'd played in the candidates, uh, you know, semifinals or something. And uh, who else did they have the first year? Uh, oh, actually, you have the cross table there the yes. first year. I'm going to have to throw that. The cross table? Yeah, yeah I think Gen Gennady Sasanko one of the world's leading theoreticians at that time. Uh, Florin Georgi, the best Romanian player. Uh, and then from the US. Uh, so what happened is I talking to these players and I was like, I think I was like 2450 IM at the time or something. Mm -hmm. And I said, listen, when you go back, tell the organizers, I will pay my own airfare if they invite me to the tournament. <laughs> Wow. Talk about, talk about jumping the line, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so anyway, so they went back and that was the deal is uh, I paid my own airfare. Now I'm a broke kid. I got nothing. Okay. <laughs> but I think I, I found $1,500 somewhere somehow and I paid my airfare <clears throat> and I got Just the invite. Just could do it. <laughs> no. So the, uh, so the U.S. representatives was myself, Walter Brown and Larry Christensen. Okay. So, uh, so you know, now the good news was, is they would publish every couple of weeks who the players were going to be. So the good news was I got to find out who all the European players, all the top players were going to be. Okay. And they knew almost nothing about me. Mm -hmm. And so I'd look up all their games. And so like in December, now keep in mind the tournament, when was the tournament? Like February? It gives a year. Uh, February, February 2014 on the 24th. Right. Oh, that's when it was so, published. Uh, 1982. Yeah. So in December of two, uh, 1981, you know, I'm living in Central Park, working with this coin dealer who's close to master brown belt taekwondo, you know, and uh, <clears throat> we go, I was doing two a day workouts in the morning, go jog in the snow around Central Park, you know, the reservoir. Okay. And, uh, but I also was preparing for white and black against each of these top players. Okay. I think mm -hmm. Ivan Radulov was there and so forth. And uh, so I'd already made, I made some of my decisions as to what I was going to play like two months before the tournament even happened. You know, like if I get black against Zoltan Ribley, what am I going to play in the Queens Indian that he hasn't already played every month against Karpov and all the other great players that he plays month after month after month. And so I made the ballsy decision that I was going to play the Dutch defense, you know, which sounds crazy <laughs> against one of the top 10 players in the world. But it was premeditated. Okay. Right. I'd actually planned that two months in advance because I figured, and against Walter Brown, what am I going to play? This guy has all his opening systems down. I mm -hmm. played the old, you know, uh, and played super solid. But anyway, so as far as the tournament itself, so I get the invite mm -hmm. and get the whole list of participants. And uh, then I board a plane that goes from New York to has a like a two hour refueling stopover in San Francisco. And then from there, flies on to, uh, to uh, I think from there, we went direct to Jakarta, to Indonesia, about like 13 hour flight from San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So I do the flight to San Francisco. They announced that 
you know, we all need to deplane, stay in the boarding area. They're going to clean the clean the, the thing, restock, refuel, and everything, and be back in you know like a couple hours. A couple hours, go back, reclaim my seat. I'm sitting there. I got some magazine with magnetic set. I'm studying, you know, whatever. Next thing, I look up, drawn down the aisle, six time, Mr. Six time, U.S. champion Walter Brown. <laughs> I'm like, holy cow! Next thing I know, he's coming right at me. Next thing I know, hey, hey, anybody in that seat? I'm like, yeah, sure, Walter, uh, go ahead. You know, turned out, what are the odds, Matthew? We totally had no idea each other was on the flight, and he was assigned the seat right next to mine. And he <gasps> had the latest games where Kasparov had just Kasparov and Sahis. Sahis had the performance of his life, 1981 Russian Championship, mm -hmm. but Kasparov had captured everyone's imagination where he won. I think two and a half out of three with white on the white side of the spot vending variation uh, where you go night a four on move 16 and sacrifice a night and all this and you know very murky and he'd won two games so imagine for a young aspiring player what could possibly be better than having a six-time u.s champion sitting there and we spend the next 13 hours analyzing the latest kasparov games what could possibly be better you know right <laughs> and because walter and i had seen each other before and you know mm -hmm. we, we play a little tennis a little ping pong you know little billiards or whatever together you know on downtime go for walks whatever you know so anyway uh i got off to an inauspicuous start i think i drew with black in about 13 moves or something on the black side of a benko gambit declined against arrestus rodriguez mm -hmm. walter chided me ron that guy's like the weakest player in the tournament how are you going to have a result if you draw with him? You know, <laughs> and I was like, okay, that was my wake up call. That, that was my warm up. Okay. And then after that, we started working together. Uh, a round or two later, uh, Matanovich. Now, today it's not so important, but back in the 60s and 70s, the Bible was the Shahovsky informant. Okay was produced every six months in Yugoslavia, had 600 to 800 of the best games in the world annotated by the best players. And that was kind of, you know, the, you know, standard. Okay. Yep. And so uh, around two or three, I'm black in a French defense and I play Alexander Matanovic. This guy's the freaking editor, <laughs> you know, editor in chief of the chess informant. Okay. But anyway, he, editor in chief or not, he makes a mistake of exchanging off the light squared bishops in an exchange kind of a trash French where I got the IQP. Next thing I know, I sink one night in on E4, I sink another night in on C4, and I get a big bind. And then eventually I cash it into a superior end game, but mm -hmm. then it's adjourned. And I did not have tremendous experience in end games at that time. But fortunately, Walter and I maybe misplayed it slightly before uh, the adjournment. And then in those days, you adjourn I think around move 60 or, or 56 or something, okay, mm -hmm. after the, you know, second session. And so we adjourned, but I still had a winning advantage. Anyway, Walter stayed up with me, and we worked it out all the way to the finish, a little finesse on the end. Like, you get one of these situations where you're going to queen your pawn, you're going to win his rook, but now you're going to have to scuttle back with your king and stop his two pass pawns on the other wing. Very typical counterplay that has to be calculated and dealt with. But at one point, uh, Walter found a move rook a4 where I could queen it with the rook, you know, and recapture on a1 with the rook, leaving my king a square closer to get back and so forth. So Walter, he nailed this. I mean, by that time, you know, he'd been playing international tournaments for quite, so he had tremendous experience that I lacked. Okay. Yeah. And so I won that game. So that was a little bit of a wake up call. And then a couple of rounds later, remember I mentioned Zoltan Ribley, who played in the quarterfinals for the world championship, one of Hungary's three or four of us players. And during that period, Hungary was the only team that was able to challenge Russia in the Olympiad every year because they had Ribley, they had Sachs, they had Portish, and they had a Dorian, and then one or two other, you know, talents. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so then I beat Ribley with black in about 30 moves. And suddenly that was a little bit of a wake up call to the rest of the tournament that, Hey, this guy might not be going away so quick, you know, because <laughs> you see it all the time in tournaments, some young upstart, quick out of the gate, but you know, then he gets his head handed to him a few times and then that's it. And you know, mm -hmm. he fades into oblivion, finds his rightful spot, you know? So anyway, then the tournament turned into kind of a bit of a race myself. Murray Chandler was having a great result. Christensen was playing well and Walter, Walter was like kicking butt and taking names. 
He crushed Ribley in a classic hanging pawns game on the white side of an A3 Queens Indian. He, he uh, several rounds later, he beat Miles in a, a German game where it's like one of these things where he's got, what is it? He's got like a, uh, he, he's like got a, a rook. And at some point he gives up his rook for the guy's bishop, for Miles Bishop. And then like 20 moves after the adjournment, he winds up with a position that looks like this. He's got a bishop on like F6 uh, or E6 and pawns on like F6, G6, H6. And, like four pawns and the black king on G8, like in a hopeless mating net in an end game. Okay. And believe it or not, Miles and I mean, uh, Walter and I had actually come to that position in our analysis, our adjournment analysis. And this, this position occurs like 20 moves after, you know, the game is actually adjourned, okay? And uh, we'd reached that position. And when he got to that position, Miles resigned, I think. Uh, wow. So, so, I mean, with White, Brown was a terror, okay? He, he was like mowing him down, like nobody's business, okay? And so when he actually played me, and I played an old Indian. We didn't. We did not agree to a draw beforehand because he didn't want to. You know. I mean, well, we just didn't. But when I played the super solid old Indian, and he saw I was in hunker down mode, <laughs> and it was going to be a long game, he, I offered him a draw, and he thought about it, and he's like, okay, uh, I hate to waste a white, but you know, <laughs> but he also didn't want to spend eight hours trying to beat me, you know. <laughs> so, so anyway, so amazingly enough, so it gets to the last round. There's a day off before the last round. <clears throat> now, I think it was myself, Christensen, and Brown all tied. Uh, Christensen had the best pairing. He had White against uh, Sidoranya. You, you'll see. Uh, no, uh, he had White against uh, one of the tail enders. I think one of the Indonesian players. Uh, I had Black. No, I had White against Tony Miles. And Brown, I think, had black and had to win a Sicilian defense. So the three players, I think we were sitting on like 16 and a half or something. And uh, Christians had clearly had the best pairing, like no question. Mm -hmm. And we had a day off before to prepare. Now, an interesting story there. The food was awesome. We played the tournament in three legs, okay? Oh, you're jumping ahead. Oh, sorry. No, I'm just seeing like... A... I was just scrolling. I was trying to scroll and scrolled the wrong way. Oh, okay. But yeah. anyway, uh, <laughs> no, no. So we played the tournament three legs. We played the first nine games in Indonesia. I mean, in Jakarta. Then we went to a place, Yogi Jakarta, you know, a few days in between. And then we started the second leg, which was, I don't know, like uh, nine games or something. And then the final stage was played in the Pertamina Cottages. Now, if you're familiar with finance history a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, before 19, in the early 1970s, OPEC formed the oil cartel. And when they had their first conference, these Pertamina cottages had been built to host all these sheiks and everyone from the Middle East, okay? So let me tell you, it was not shabby, okay? <laughs> and then, of course, the conference had been and gone and whatever, and now it was open for, you know, high-end visitors. And so that was where we played the third and final leg, you know, mm -hmm. was at the Pertamina cottages. So it was very nice. So they had this buffet. So the day before, <clears throat> on the off day, I go there, you know, for my lunch, you know, somewhere around the middle of the day, around 11 or whatever. And uh, over at one table is a number of the Yugoslav, I mean, the East European players, as Ron tries to be politically correct and fails miserably. Uh, so number of the East European players, okay? And I'm sitting there. Uh, no, I come in, and all the other tables are big. And we're talking about a pretty good-sized dining room. And yeah. there's a big buffet spread out. And then the only player I see is, uh, I, I forget, was I there first or, or Miles? Anyway, I think uh, I, I think Miles comes in and uh, there's no one, he, he gets his food or whatever. And then he's like, mind if I sit? I'm like, sure. Now, first place on the line. Yep. Ron sitting there. Tied for first, talking to his next round opponent. Uh, what do you think these East European players are starting to assume? <laughs> the worst. <laughs> the worst, exactly. Yep. You know, 
And the truth of the matter is, is, uh, is, you know, we just chatted pleasantly. I mean, I'd known Miles from before. I'd seen him in Manchester. He beat me in a tournament. In fact, I, I played in one tournament. It was like a weekend Swiss. And then part of my deal with the organizers had been I was supposed to do an exhibition. That Friday night, I get there to do the exhibition. And Miles shows up. And turns out they double booked us. And he was very gracious. He's like, Ron, you do it. I'm like, okay. And so I did it, I don't know, a couple hundred pounds, whatever it was, mm -hmm. okay? Which was a lot of money to me. To him, it was, you know, pocket change on a weekend tournament in between category 10 tournaments. Okay? Yeah, this is 1982 and too. And so, <laughs> so, I mean, we knew each other. We were on decent terms. We did not talk about the whole the game the whole day, except we made some comment that, yeah, they probably think we're tossing the game, you know? <laughs> Other than that, we didn't say anything, okay? Anyway, because these Europeans saw us having lunch the day before, they just assumed that the game was a toss job, you know, okay? Mm -hmm. But tell you the truth, Matthew, a game this important, that's not how you want to win it. You want to play the game and whatever happens, happens. Now, the truth of the matter is, is Brown did a calculation because, you know, Brown was a professional player. And uh, I've never really mentioned this before. Uh, and he's like, Ron, look, I want you to get the Grandmaster title, okay? But it's going to cost me money. You know, if you win the game and I'm going to help you win the game, and it's gonna cost me. And Brown, meanwhile, had beaten Miles the last five times in a row with White. <laughs> you think I wanted his help? Oh, heck yeah. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> yeah, I said, Brown, Walter, Walter, come on, Sean, you tell me how much it's gonna cost you for me to win this game. And, you know, I'll pay you, you know, uh, to help me for this one game. So we struck a deal, which was fair, because mm -hmm. he's a professional. This is his income. And if he helps me win, it is going to cost him money. So I recognize that. And plus, there's no one else in the world at this time and moment. The guy's helped me. He's been there, supported each other, you know, for 24 games mm -hmm. over a month. This is the guy I want in my corner for this last game. So, of course, so he's got me prepped. One time Brown played, uh, Miles played B6 against him, D4, B6. Another time he did this. Another time, man, the Queen's Indian. He's got me, like, ready. So... Best laid plans of mice and men, right? Mm -hmm. Time to play the game, one o'clock. And by the way, I was very professional. I had my whole routine, like what time I would get up, what time I would exercise. I would even lay my clothes out. I had two little twin beds. I'd lay my clothes out that I was going to wear the day before. You know, wow. I'd lay out what I was going to wear. I mean, Super you don't want to be running around five minutes before the match. Oh, that shirt, shirt smells. I can't wear that. You know, whatever. <laughs> You're smiling. You've been there, right? Yeah. <laughs> yep. right? uh, <laughs> let me throw on something, get down to the turn. No. And then I had my whole routine. I'd have lunch like at a certain time. You want to eat lunch, in my opinion. You don't want to eat three hours before because you don't want to be hungry during the game. Okay. I think maybe about an hour before. Uh, so that, that way you, you have time to digest and everything, mm -hmm. but also not so far apart that you're hungry during the game. And then I would study tactics for about 90 minutes in the morning, or I mean, for maybe 30, 40 minutes in the morning, certain amount of time on openings. But then I would lay down and I'd just lay in bed, take a short quasi nap. And then the very last thing, at Pertamina, we could walk to the tournament hall. I'd study one in-game composition, just one. Try to solve it, just to have clarity of mind, clarity of vision, you know. And like I'm walking into the tournament hall thinking about this queen and knight versus queen and bishop and how you walk them all the way to the corner, then you got this trick and you knight fork them and then you win the king and pawn in game. And I'm walking into the tournament hall and that's where my headspace is. I'm thinking about that. I'm not thinking about, oh, what if he plays this opening or how many rating points I'm gonna lose or what's gonna, no. I'm thinking about how the pieces or, you know, just move majestically together and coordinate and so forth. And I got a very clear head, okay? Okay. So now I'm about as ready as I could be. Bam, he plays knight c6. I play knight f3, still trying to thinking, and now he goes d5. I'm like, oh, crap. I haven't really prepared for this. <laughs> now, the irony is that in 1981, I had actually played the Chagorn against Yusupov in Lone Pine and actually made a draw where I was like two pawns up in Rukening, but I didn't have a German help at that time. And then, of course, afterwards, Benko's like, oh, I would have helped you beat a Russian, you know? Yeah, thanks, after the fact. <laughs> anyway, so I play here, and he goes there, and I'm, like, already starting to think about, like, what I should do. Mm -hmm. So, now, of course, the most famous original game 
in the Chagorn defenses, Alaska Chagorn, which Chagorn won. And they talk a lot about how he blockaded and barricaded with the night. By the way, Andy Soltis years ago did a uh, book on the Chagorn defense for chest digest. Well, I wouldn't call it a book in those days. They were really like pamphlets, okay? And uh, that, that was the big classic game that they gave. And later I asked Soltis, do you really believe some of those evaluations you gave in that pamphlet? He just kind of smiled that wry smile at me like, you know, like that was one of those crank out jobs. <laughs> But nonetheless, look, I managed to draw a great player like Yusupov with black, and yeah. I was actually better, you know. Okay, so anyway, so I go for this variation, but then he takes, and then I take, and he takes, and I go here, and now mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just strictly winging it. So now he goes here. Okay, so when you're entering this game, he plays into the Shigorin, like, you have very little preparation? Yeah. Okay. All my, all my prep out the window. <laughs> but on the other hand, what I did have was that I was in fantastic form. Mm -hmm. I was able to calculate long variations. I had very clear thinking, okay? okay? And I wasn't lacking confident. I mean, I wasn't overconfident. But mm -hmm. on the other hand, I understood that a chess game, and especially at the lower levels, it, it's not like in the days of the chess informant, you'd be led to believe, like we used to kid about this guy, Florin Gurgiu. He'd annotate 90 or 150 games in the informant. Okay. We used to kid that he had a... Uh, uh, what, what, what do you call it? A uh, a pattern. White plays a new move, exclamation point. White's a little better. Five or six moves later, white plays another exclamation point. Maybe black plays a dubious. Now, big advantage, plus over minus, okay? A few more moves, slightly weak move. Okay, now white's winning. Okay. That was his kind of prosaic formula, you know, gotcha. <laughs> for annotating. <laughs> a chess game is not like that, Matthew. <laughs> chess game, especially at the lower levels and the lower you get, there's more, it's more like a winding road with many bumps and turns, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so here's the thing. The best frame of mind to be in is where you're on a very level keel. You don't get too excited when you're winning. You don't get too depressed when you're losing, okay? Just have a very even temperament. If you ever watch the Polgars, Judith Polgar, play Blitz Chess, you cannot tell whether she's winning or losing, okay? No, just and, and she straight just up attack. <laughs> yeah, just keeps zapping out moves, okay, in positions that are hopeless. I, I would have trouble finding moves, and she just keeps, you know, zipping out. And the reason it's the best to have an even keel is because when the opportunity does come, like as we'll see in this game, if you got a nice level mind and you're not clouded with, you know, confusion and emotion and everything, yeah. then you're in position to take advantage of it, okay? But too many players, when they're winning, they get all giddy, and then that's when you're setting yourself up to a mistake. And also when they're losing, like you remember, I mentioned this game in the Texas Junior Championship. Boy, was I depressed. Thank God the guy told me the winning move. Rook to D1 check, right? <laughs> <laughs> but otherwise, so if you're too depressed or too ecstatic, you're, you're not going to have the clarity of thought to take advantage when your moment is presented. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, look, if you're playing a Karpov or a Magnus in their, in their prime, the opportunity may never be presented. Okay. <laughs> But playing most mortal humans, you know, mm -hmm. you're going to get some opportunity. Okay. How, how about and the uh... Miles at this time? What was Miles' FIDE rating? He was probably close to 2,600 at this time. Keep in mind, ratings were much lower then. Yeah. So he might have been 2,575 or something, you know. But he was probably top 10 in the world at this time. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, I mean, keep in mind, Karpov and Kasparov were the first players to pierce, like, after Fisher, 2,700 or something. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I think there was a period where they were the only two players in the world, Fisher and Karpov, that were like over, even Spassky at his prime probably was 2610 or something. Okay. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, looking back, I don't know, what does the computer recommend here? Maybe Bishop G5? Actually, the move you played. <laughs> F3? Uh-huh. Top move. But now he plays E5. And when I take... I'm thinking, okay, he'll sack, I'll take, he'll have some compensation, I'll play my king up to C2, you know, kind of shades of a C3 Sicilian type thing or something. Mm -hmm. Now the guy goes knight D7. I'm like, ah, oh, geez. Okay. So I go E4. Now I'm thinking he'll take the pawn back. Mm -hmm. Nope. He goes bishop B4. And I'm literally winging it move by move here. I go queen yep. D3. Now he goes queen h4 check, loosening me up. I go g3. 
he goes queen e7 and i'm literally burning time thinking every single move here mm -hmm. so what about him is he moving pretty like... quick <clears throat> do what was he moving oh, pretty yeah. quick yeah he's playing pretty fast mm -hmm. well what to do i don't want to go bishop g2 and then when he retakes this guy the d3 square is horribly weak okay mm -hmm. if i go bishop g2 i'm threatening to play f4 but <clears throat> i play bishop e2 mm -hmm. Now he goes, knight takes e5, gets his pawn back. And again, I'm calculating like a machine. I'm sitting here. I am not a happy camper. Mm -hmm. One, nothing has gone as planned. Two, not really thrilled with my position. He's got all his minor pieces developed. And I got like nothing to show for it. <laughs> mm -hmm. How do you feel now looking at it? Uh, how's he about? Uh, now I feel it's still unclear. I, okay. Is it close to equal here? Uh it says white has a slight edge, very slight. Edge. Really? Mm -hmm. I wish you would have told it, me that 38 it years. <laughs> it, it didn't like knight takes e5. Oh. Things, yeah. What, what did it like here? Uh, long castles. Yeah, that makes sense because, look, he can get the pawn back on e5 later. Mm -hmm. And if I go f4, I'll just lose the e4 pawn. Yeah. Okay, so long castles make sense. It's okay. actually almost a, almost a half pawn, more than a half pawn advantage. For black, you mean? Yeah. Okay. And going up. So fortunately, Miles did not play like stockfish. Like five. <laughs> so I played bishop f4. That was after considerable calculation. You you might think to play bishop d2 and castle queenside, but then again, when he castles, that d3 square is looking pretty shaky. You know. Mm -hmm. So, so I mean, what, what does it recommend here? I uh, just want to mention a comment here in the Twitch chat. Um, saying that you were all getting prepared for the game, and you still had to pay Walter for this. <laughs> he deserved it. Mm -hmm. I'm benefiting from, you know, him having 15 to 20 years of international experience. And mm -hmm. keep in mind, he just crushed Miles the last five games with white pieces. Yeah. Would you pay for that kind of coaching in the game of your life? Absolutely. <laughs> like without question, mm -hmm. you know. Okay, so. Sorry, go and ahead. I'll tell you, mm -hmm. after after 20 years on Wall Street, paying Walter Brown, you know, a few hundred dollars to prepare me was one of the best investments I ever made in my life. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, no, you got to put things in perspective. Okay. Right. You like, want to increase point, your chances. No, at that point, exactly. Because look, you got a uh, one game to achieve a once in a lifetime goal that you've worked and studied hours and hours and years for, mm -hmm. and this is the one guy as you exactly put, can increase your chances, even if it's by five, eight, or 10%. And then also to the confidence factor of knowing that I had him back in me, that he was there for me, helping me, you know, rooting me on, mm -hmm. was definitely much more psychologically better than spending two days, like you're both camped out in your rooms, you know, because, you know, you're hoping the other one doesn't win, you know? Right. So anyway, I played Bishop F4 here. What does the computer recommend here? Bishop F4. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Now he played knight back to g6. Now here, I could chill with the bishop and go back to d2 and then castle long. Mm -hmm. but... Actually, um, on your computer in the top right hand, there's a little bar you can click and it will turn on the stockfish for you. A little top right hand? Mm -hmm. Right just below your name. I'm not seeing it. Oh, inbox. Board, language, sound, background, preferences, well, inbox. Well, not not on your name, but below your name. So exit I, that dial, exit the box. I don't I don't see it. Huh. Oh well. Okay. Anyway, anyway. Uh, there's some <laughs> stuff down here, like opening repertoire, table base, practice with computer. No, nah, it's not that stuff. Stuff down there. Yeah. Anyhow. All right. Oh well. I <laughs> castled. Does the computer agree with castling? Uh, no. No, it probably wanted me to play bishop back to d2, right? That is correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyway, he took, mm -hmm. I took, and I considered this position dynamically equal, okay? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I wasn't thrilled with it still. And now he played rook to d8. Mm -hmm. I don't know why he didn't just castle uh, kingside. Mm-hmm. I think would have been perfectly okay for him. He played rook d8. Then I took. And he took with the king. And then one of the moves here was totally inexplicable. 
So I played knight d5. Okay. <laughs> now here he could take that. Mm -hmm. And then I could either play queen check, which some probably pretty high probability of a draw. Although, you know, that end game can be played. I mean, middle game, kind of bishop opposite color middle game. Mm -hmm. Now, by the way, that's another very important point. Bishop opposite color. Petrosian, well, first Capablanca, then Petrosian, also Nimsvich, were great with bishops opposite color, okay? And then, but today's players, if you notice, Fabiano Caruana and Magnus Carlsen, they win a lot of these rook and bishop versus rook and bishop opposite color, okay? Mm -hmm. They win a lot. If you start to make a notice, a mental note of it, okay. you'll be surprised how many they win. So I'm, I'm fully expecting bishop takes, queen takes, and then I kind of got light squares, he's kind of got dark squares, and instead he played here check. I went king over. Now, again, if he takes, I can contemplate rook to d1, okay? Mm -hmm. Pinning as opposed to just retaking right away, okay? And then I'm looking to try and open things up while his king is in the center. Mm -hmm. But now he played bishop back. And then I played rook c1, mm -hmm. and he played queen to d6. Now, on rook c1, if he tries to simplify now by playing like this, mm -hmm. I can take here. He takes on b3, I take, and then at least I'm going to snag a pawn. Okay? Yeah. Pretty good prospects. He's got to save the bish, right? Yep. Uh, that looks like the only legal square. <laughs> and then I take, and, you know, look, we got an extra pawn to work with. You know, in a must-win game, you know, that's, you'll take it. Yeah. Yeah, he goes rook to d1. I mean, uh, queen to d6. And now... Rook to d1, a little quiet move. Now, remember we said dark squares and light squares, right? So if, if we look, we can see I'm all camped out on the light squares. You mm -hmm. see? And so this, this is an important concept. I even started teaching kids at a young age, you know, like right when you first teach them chess. Yep. Color concepts. Why not? Look. Half the squares are light, half are dark, you know? Mm -hmm. But it's amazing, Matthew, how many games I've won against masters where you just penetrate, take control of one color complex, and it's like you got an easy pass to zip around on those squares, okay? Interesting. And okay. on top of that, their bishops, dee, 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 can't touch this, right? <laughs> <laughs> so see this dark squared bishop over here? Mm -hmm. Pretty useless, okay? But yet, uh, for some reason, at most lower levels, they don't talk about color complex. Okay, mm -hmm. but it's actually, at, I'm sorry. Uh, at my level in the 1700 range, I think about it, but I don't put enough importance on it. I didn't think it was like, oh, you just think of one concept and you can actually just take down a whole person. <laughs> but here's the thing. Also, you can think certain openings, like the mm -hmm. King's Indian defense, black is playing on the dark squares, white plays on the light squares. And so usually games where black triumphs, like Kasparov's sacrifice, and Knight takes F2, the dark square or something, you know, and uh, and then games were white triumphs. It's usually penetration on the light square, some something into c6 or something, uh, trading the light squared bishops and so forth. And so, uh, but it's a very powerful concept if you start to incorporate it. If you if you study the games of Karpov, once he gets a winning position, notice how time and time again suddenly it's like magic. All his pieces wind up on the light squares, and then the guy's dark squared bishop is like useless. Okay, and okay. and it almost seems like magic until you actually stop and think about it. And then you realize it was actually magic slash intentional <laughs> uh, or habit. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, see some of the, uh, a lot of the same thing in Magnus's play. Okay. So anyway, King E8, I think, is this where he played? One of these moves he played here was just like totally crazy. Now here he could play King C8, mm -hmm. then I could play Knight B6 check and I could pick off the queen and then I take on F7. Mm -hmm. So. Anyway, he played king e8. And then I played this move, bishop b5. And I forget if it was this move or the next move. Yeah, here he played rook b f8. I'm not sure why. <laughs> yeah, keep in mind, guys, this is about uh, 40 years ago. So to remember ideas from that far, it's kind of difficult. <laughs> uh, you know, we get old, we forget things. Um, mm -hmm. Like here, I, I don't know what rook f8 was all about. Uh, or maybe it was his king takes on d8 that was really questionable. I forget. But anyway, I played bishop b5. Mm -hmm. And then he played something. It was either here or the next move. 
he played rook f8 and then mm -hmm. i played queen a4 and then i, I felt the table shake mm -hmm. it's true and i felt it, well, like a little tremor and next thing i know i look up and everyone's like we got to leave <laughs> and this, this is true story break. this is true story oh, so no. we all exit the building at this point okay and then after about 10 or 15 minutes there's no after effect or whatever then okay everybody can go back we go back miles sits down he starts studying the position and he's like wow i didn't realize it was this bad <laughs> <laughs> so anyway but but actually white black's probably lost here surprisingly enough there, there's no defense and again notice light square light square light square light square light square and then i am attacking on the light squares and then i'm attacking this guy you see mm -hmm. so the problem is his a5 bishop well he can't play pawn to b6 to protect it obviously the c6 bishop would be hanging okay and so what to do if he uh moves the bishop like say he plays bishop back to b6 mm -hmm. well then again my rook's protected right i can just simply steal this guy you know with a discovered attack on the queen okay mm -hmm. and so actually the position is a stockfish showing that i'm like plus three or something probably uh it's plus six seven it's ridiculous oh okay yep. <laughs> yeah so it's even better than I, I i thought and every bit as bad as miles had thought <laughs> <laughs> so now in the game he plays but your pieces are on light squares again yeah yeah he plays bishop takes after mm -hmm. some thought now i could play queen takes and then on c6 take this when he takes that i take here and then his situation is actually compounded because now he has to go queen to guard. He's got to guard that square. And the wherever he goes, square, yeah. yeah, then I can just zig and zag, you know, and this is this is going to be pretty quick somehow. <laughs> There's probably a, a mate and two or something here. Let's see. E5 check. Yeah, I think you could do it this way. Check. Something like this. Okay. There might be something earlier. <laughs> but so in the game, at this point, he played bishop takes. And so we agree I could play queen takes, mm -hmm. but I just took this guy. Because, you know, when you're winning, keep it simple. Okay. I have two simple threats. I threaten queen takes bishop check, and I threaten knight takes on c7, again, exposing the, the rook on the queen. Yeah, mm -hmm. protected. Yep. I got two threats. <laughs> so he played. Uh, after bishop b5, queen a5, he played queen c5, and then I got to hit him with this one. Check. <sighs> Check. And knight takes b5, and that's why we practice tactics in the morning for 30 minutes every day. <laughs> <laughs> now, Miles to, to, was very magnanimous. He was first to congratulate me because it was pretty clear that not only would I get the norm, I would actually get the title because they designed the tournament specifically for that. Now, okay. things may have made a very minor exception, you know, that was lobbied for by the USCF to allow for, uh, they never had a 25 round tournament, you know, I mean, not since the days of like Hastings 1895, <laughs> did they have <laughs> such long tournaments. And so they made an exception and went ahead and, uh, you know, uh, gave me the Grandmaster title. I think mm -hmm. I had 25, my rating got up to 2520. Probably I made a mistake at that point because I was waiting for the ratings to get published and catch up. And when I was in this kind of form, man, I should have just kept playing. I mean, like, man, just keep. Instead, I stopped playing and just, you know, I, I mean, I, I kept studying and everything. Yeah. But uh, in those days, it was very hard to get invitations. And then I think the next big tournament I played in was Hastings, which had a very strong lineup. God, guys like Maganian, Tukmakov, Kovacevic, mm -hmm. uh, usual British players. And I messed up several promising positions. Like I was two pawns up in a rook inning against one of the British earlier. And so I had a pretty disappointing result. Although that said, I did win a nice game against a young boy named Nigel Short. Ah. <laughs> so to this day, my score is one and zero against Nigel. Nigel <laughs> is beating Kasparov. So I'm close. You know? <laughs> so now we have to check your Magnus number. <laughs> exactly oh who knows that's probably far <laughs> far away so uh i think we covered enough time we had one other game but i don't think we necessarily have to cover it i think we did a yeah. good job what do you think you i know? think yeah you know, i'm always here if you want to do one more or if you want to do another day 
or we can end it. Yes, yeah, up to you. I mean, it's your no, time. Maybe, maybe, yeah, we maybe another time we'll do another show. Sounds great. Yeah, because absolutely. One, one of the great games in my experience was, you know, during my work with Karpov, but maybe that's a subject for another day, okay? Possibly, and I think it would be great to do as a different segment altogether. I, can, I agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Anyway, hey, Ron, I think that pretty much covers anything. Uh, anything else? Ron, that, honestly, that this was amazing. The, I loved it. <laughs> that takes you up to the moment. That was the game that got me the Grandmaster title. All right. <laughs> you got to be able to see that three mover and dominate on the light squares and not get upset when the opening doesn't go as planned, right? <laughs> Just being sharp tactically, and yeah, it's like um, like you were saying, it's just uh, being being pre better prepared than your opponents, and just getting. Lucky. Yeah, I think I think right in here when I played, uh, and, and again, see the point about being in good form, keeping a level head. Mm -hmm. When the opportunity came up, you know, the rest of the game, I don't know what the computer says, but the rest of the game from these points where I played like rook d1, rook c1, bishop b5, I think I probably played pretty close to flawless, you know, and I yeah. took advantage of the moment, you know, that was given to me. Okay. Yeah. So as far as the opening, I think Mike Tyson had a great quote. Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the nose. Yep. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's true. So, mm -hmm. okay. I'll let you go. By the way, I wanted to thank you for your technical help in, you know, getting my own hen chest launched. I mean, mm -hmm. huge, huge help. No, absolutely. Because, Anytime. Uh, Speaking of and, hen chest guys, go ahead and Show your support to Ron Henley here. He has his own Twitch channel. I'm pointing at it right now. Hen Chess. Go ahead and give it a follow. I'll put it into the chat box as well here. And uh, yeah, he does great streams on there. He plays against uh, people on uh, ICC, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. ICC, if you guys don't know, is actually an excellent program. I've been using it quite a bit recently. Um, it's, it's nice and old school type of, type of learning to me. And I really like that because... Uh, Everyone's all on the computer now, all digital. And it's like, no, pull out a, pull out a regular board and pull out a book. You know, mm -hmm. be normal. <laughs> so, so. Yeah, gen the general format there, Matthew, is that we do, uh, well, the last four or five shows, we've been doing a short 15-minute uh, presentation on Rookin Games. Mm -hmm. Rookin Games, very important. Uh, Minev wrote a book in around 2003, and he said, in tournament play, mm -hmm. Rookin, because of the survivor, you know, gene, starting out in the corner, tend to occur in about 50% of all in games in tournament play. Now, yeah. that might be slightly high, but nonetheless, it shows the importance. Well, and as you showed, Magnus Carlsen, 2013 World Championship, Rook in game. Game six, yep. huge. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad you brought that one up, too. I'm going to be studying those games. Actually, I'm going to go through this entire interview, write down everything that you said. <laughs> go ahead and check this out. And I was like, all right, I'll go ahead and do this. Okay. Okay, so... <laughs> Are we good to go? Yeah, we're good to go. So, I get lunch? Ron, yep, exactly. And some Starbucks. Matthew, lunch. thank you for having me. And thank all our viewers for taking time to check in on us. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And appreciate it. I think. Have a great evening. Okay, thanks. Bye. Talk to you later. You can skip this ad.